some on it. Pastor Andy's going to hit some on it and all our other preachers. We're going to be talking about the calling. The calling. What is that? The calling. The calling. It's another branch to my other message series that was entitled The Handshake of God. Where God calls us, everybody in this room, there is a calling. And when Jesus said, he who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. If you listen, you'll hear God calling you. Chris. Chris. Jeremy. Johnson. He's calling us. And we're going to define every calling. And we'll begin to recognize that our purpose on earth is all contingent in how we respond to the calling of God. Oh, y'all with me? Say yes. And today, I want to talk about raising a family. The call to raise a godly family. Since it is back to school and I have 40 minutes. I know you already stood up. I feel like a Catholic church now. Let's all stand up again. In reading God's word and wherever there is bold and underline that's where you come in with a there we go i want listen a lot of churches do not practice public reading of god's word and it's so important that we do we're going to read from the book of ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 through 33 and then we'll skip into chapter 6 verse 4 verse 1 through 4 it says this for husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Ooh, man, that's a sermon right there all by itself. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. Remember, it reference the church as the wife. Yeah. That's for later on. Verse 28, in the same way, If guys, if you just follow that advice, there will be no divorces. We like, a lot of us like to blame the women. Everything rises and falls on leadership. All the women should say amen right now. All the men are like, I ain't going to the chicken, uh, chicken wing thing anymore. All right. Chicken wing thing. We have a, what is it? Wings and wiffle ball. Scott, you got to be a part of Wings and Wiffle Ball. We're, we're having a chicken wing competition, and then we're having a Wiffle Ball home run derby. All right, so make sure Scott signs up, right? Verse 31 says, as the scriptures say. Oh, did I skip it? Did I skip something? My wife has my notes. She's cheating. Usher, remove her. No. Verse 29, no one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. Verse 31 says, as the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and his joints and his wife, and the two are united into one. You know what that means? A woman never leaves her daddy. A man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife. That means that a woman should have a father. And then when he is married, the man leaves his father and mother. And clings. That means a woman should ne will never leave her daddy because her biological father is now gone. And her husband becomes her daddy, her covering, her protector. That's why I look at my wife and say, baby, who are your daddy? <laughs> Made it weird, didn't I? (laughs) 
Where am I at? Verse 32. <laughs> this is a great mystery. Yes, it is. But it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. This is so deep. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Come on, man! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, Children, That's right, students. Verse 2, uh, verse two says, Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. Read verse 3. That's right. That's why I honor my mom's here today. That's why I honor my mom. And she is, she is my secret formula for my prosperity. Verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. This is God's word. You may be seated. I will only preach a portion of this because I don't want to go later because we have school supplies to give. But I want to leave you with some principles and some stuff for you to chew on and go back home and study. Let's talk about this calling thing because the concept of calling in the Bible is very rich and is very multifaceted. It's, it's, it's deeply embedded in the narrative of God's relationship with humanity. Amen. Always remember that. Because the calling transcends a mere invitation or a task. The calling signifies a divine summons that shapes identity, it shapes purpose, and destiny. Are y'all hearing me? The word calling in the Bible is translated from several Hebrew and Greek terms. So let's learn a little Hebrew today. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is kara, which means to call out or to proclaim. Ah, okay. In the New Testament, the Greek word kaleo, kaleo, and its derivatives... Is it up there? There it is. And its derivatives like klesis and kletos are used denoting an invitation or a summons. All right? So the usage of these terms then begins to vary from a literal call, as in calling someone's name, to a, watch this, metaphorical sense implying a divine invitation to participate in God's purposes on earth. Folks, you are not the byproduct of a man and a woman's orgasm. You are here for a purpose. You are here, and God does not create junk. When God decided that you needed to belong on this earth, you were given a purpose, but the, now the ball is on your court, and we have to recognize this call so we can know why the heck we're here for. For example, God calls Abraham in Genesis 12, 1, to leave this country his country, and to leave his family initiating a covenant relationship with God. And in the New Testament, Jesus calls his disciples, Mark chapter 117, to follow him, to follow him, which signifies a call, watch this, to transformation and a call to mission. God's calling you. He's calling you. Maybe that's why you're so frustrated and you live your life with such frustration. It's because you know you hear the call. You just don't agree with it. And as much as he loves you and as much as you have people praying for you, you're going to feel more frustration. Folks, I'm convinced. Listen, you know what prayer works the best? I call it the prayer uh, of uh, whatever it takes. 
I would pray for people to hit rock bottom and, and hit it so hard that they finally recognize that the whole reason why their life is so jacked up is because they've been denying God the whole time and ignoring the call of God on their life. We've been called. Every one of us have been called. So I, what I want to do, I want to dive into the many callings to help us better than understand our purpose on earth and how we function that through our church. So today, I want to get really, really practical. And if you give me about 20 minutes, I'll do as much as I can here. I want to talk about the call to raise a family. Wait, hey, everybody. See, many of us think calling of God has to do with a specific calling. No, there's several callings. And everyone here, everyone, even though, even if you are not able to have children, everyone here, even though you're not married, everybody who is alive has a calling to raise a family. Yes. I'm going to explain that in just a little bit. But before I do, I have some bad news for you. Let's talk about some sobering facts here. Sobering facts. Um, let's throw them up there, guys. Here's some sobering facts. If a child accepts Christ first, there is a, there is a 3.5 chance per, percent of the whole family becoming Christian. If a mother accepts Christ first, there is a 17% chance of the whole family becoming followers of Christ. Give me the next one. If the father accepts Christ first, there is a 93% chance of the whole family. Why do you think Pastor Andy has such a heart for men to get right with God and we need to reach men and fathers? Right now, we have 74 million Gen, Gen Zers, which equal to one-fourth of all Americans. Two-thirds of teenagers are expected to leave the church when they become adults. Teenagers in the U.S. are two times as likely to identify as atheists or agnostics. Negative, is that, no, no, not negative. 3%, sorry, Ugh, I was going to say, that's not weird. 3% of teens read their Bibles every day, only 3%. Today's teens are more isolated and disconnected than any other generation. By the way, we get this from the Barna Foundation, which they are known for their statistics and polling uh, 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 around the world. Today, 54% of teens have over four hours of screen time every day. Folks, this is, this is pretty tough. This is pretty tough, and these are sobering Facts, and this is where we need to know how to raise a family. This is why we all have a calling from God to raise and build our family in the ways of the Lord. Amen. Christians in our nations have a crisis in this calling. Unfortunately, we have people reproducing but not building families with a godly purpose. I expect this of the world of non-believers. It breaks my heart when it happens among believers. So what has to happen? We got to learn how to manage God's calling in our lives. Because managing God's calling in our lives is another word for work. Work. And work is that four-letter word that many of us do not like. And I'm talking about hard work because, they, listen, folks, a biblical view of work runs throughout all of Scripture. Check this out, Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and said to them, Ooh, hey, y'all don't backslid on me. Stay with me. All right, everybody. Genesis 1, 28, bold and underlined. You come in. Here we go. God blessed them and said to them, Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Folks, in Genesis, then, we are given a cultural mandate, a calling, if you will, to use our lives to cultivate and to grow 
God's purpose on earth. So our work, how we engage the mandate God gave humanity, this work then plays part in God's plan for restoration. And this plan of restoration was laid out all the way from Genesis to the book of Revelation. But because of sin, but because of disobedience, then what happens is we've lost sight of this perspective. And as a result, as a result, we've lost any sense of this calling. We lost it. We went from being living lives of significance to just surviving. We're no better than a, a weed or a bug. We just want to live another day. So the question is, what is God's calling and what does it mean for our lives? Y'all with me yet? All right, let's keep going. Let, let, me, let me reference two callings. The, the first calling is the general calling. The primary meaning of a, of a calling in Scripture is a general one. That's the primary meaning. We're called out of an old sinful way of life into a new redeemed and faithful way of life. It is the call to salvation. That's the first calling. If you're born again, congratulations, you have you have responded to that calling. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who calls you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Woo! He called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. light. Now, Hebrews 3, 1 Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, read. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. You see that? It's a general calling to be born again. The second calling, oh, now it gets complicated. It's a specific calling. Somebody say specific calling. This type of call is used in 1 Corinthians 17. Uh, uh, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 17 to 24, and it refers to our state or condition of life. Now, we're going to read a little bit here, so, but it's so important because I'd rather you read Scripture than hear me preaching. It says here, uh, uh, each of you, read, This is my rule. For all the churches, for, for instance, a man who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. And a man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not uh, be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. There we go. Now, it gets crazier. Are you a slave? Then don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And, and remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave to Christ. Man, I love, I love this. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Read verse 24. I mean, let me unpack this for a little bit. So in this passage, it repeats the refrain, let each man remain in that calling in which he was called to. Meaning this, even though the specific calling doesn't speak particularly to only our jobs, careers, or even ministries, in our specific calling, we are to always be faithful to where he has us, especially in our work. Raising a godly family. Raising a godly family. So quit complaining about the job you're in. If you rejoice, 
over your job and you thank God for it, he might give you a better job. And if you start a family, keep it. Some of you men, I'm telling you sometimes, I love you, but I, 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 I would love to go to the ER room, me and you, as, as the doctor removes my foot from your butt. Come on. Come on. Come on. Get all tempted and crazy and, and, and you immediately want to leave your wife and leave your family and find something else. I know, listen, listen, once you're born again, and I know you probably didn't have a father as a good example, but there is no reason once you're in the house of God that you, there are fathers in this house that want to teach you the right way, how to live a life of integrity and purpose and character, and by all means, don't repeat the same sin and mistakes that your father did. You're a new creation. If I offended you about that doctor thing, I painted a picture. Sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> Folks, if you, if, you, if you can't have a specific calling, excuse me, you can't have a specific calling without fulfilling a general calling. Let's just get that right. You've got to be born again first. But the general calling is a calling to be faithful to the Lord in every area of your lives. Now, scripture primarily emphasizes first on a general call. Because we're called to a new way of life to be faithful to God. We get so bogged down in our general calling. I just want people to be faithful in their, in the, excuse me, we get bogged down in our specific calling. I want people to be just faithful to their general calling. Scripture's primary emphasis is always on the general calling, which means that to be faithful to God, our families, our church, our nation as citizens, and our work, we have to be found faithful. Why? Because our faithfulness can sometimes be gauged by examining our priorities, primarily in how we spend our time. Ooh, because time is the only commodity that God gave you. Jose, I've made money and I've lost money. I've gotten jobs and I lost jobs. I bought stuff and I lose stuff. I've gained weight and then gained weight again and then lost some. <laughs> but time is the only thing that God gave me and every second that passes by, I have less of it. When we are faithful to the calling God's placed on our lives, then watch this. We'll experience meaning. Oh, yes. We'll experience significance. We begin to experience wholeness. And I'm going to tell you, those were happy people live at. They have meaning, significance, wholeness. In our prior, if, but if our priorities are skewed, then we won't experience meaning, significance, and wholeness. Why? Because our priorities are jacked up. You've been called to a purpose to use your gifts to serve the common good, to glorify God and then advance his kingdom. Amen. By God's grace, we can know why we are called, what we're called to, and how we are to do it. Amen. And that's one of the purposes of this church. We intend to be a purpose-finding factory for you. We want to disciple you and get you to the place where things that are out of order come into order. And then you have a revelation and understanding of what it means to know your calling First, your general calling and then your specific calling so that you can then wake up and recognize that every day it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to fulfill the plan and the call of God on your life. And life becomes exciting. And the greatest specific calling in your life is to raise a godly family. Amen. Oh, man, that was my intro. All right, let's dig into this then. 
principles of calling a family, of a family calling. Number one, always know that you're creating a legacy. Amen. You are creating a legacy. Watch this. These, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through, 12, 1 through 2 says, these are the commands, decrees, and the laws. Uh, the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that, read it. As long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. You're building a legacy. It literally says, pass it on to the next generation. Folks, I want my kids to hear and remember the reports and the testimonies. Folks, one of... Pastor Victoria and I's goals as parents is, to, is for our kids to meet other kids that say, hey, your dad and your mom changed my life. Come on. Oh, that's huge. Come on. So, 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 so the time is now for us to start a family legacy. Our parents began that in us, and I want to establish it in those that I'm pouring in. So what are we to do? We make a plan, create a culture, and by doing so, God will use you to create destiny in the lives of your children. Amen. Are y'all hearing that? Say yes. Yeah. So in other words, it's not time to get lazy. Come on. This thing is bigger than you are. Yes. You started it right by giving your life to Christ. Yeah. You start off right. By being a part of your church, by putting into practice the principles that you've learned, you begin to prioritize and make Jesus the center of your life, that out of that center, everything else moves. Yes. So that's number one. Number two, on raising a godly family, family, you are the spiritual thermostat of your home. So we need to learn to share life with each other. And listen, some of you young adults, you're saying, oh, this ain't for me. Oh, goodness gracious. This is exactly for you. You don't need to learn from your mistakes. You need to learn from somebody else's mistakes. So when we do, folks, we set the tone and rhythm for a home life. What did Joshua say? He said this in Joshua 24, 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whom, whose land you are living. Read it. you got to make a determination. You will serve God. And God has to be First and center of everything. So what do you do? You show them how to love God. Deuteronomy 6, 5. Love the Lord your God with? All your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Whoo, yes you do. Here's another one. Show them how to fear the Lord. Yes, Psalms 103, 17 says, but from everything to everlasting, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. Read it. And his righteousness with their children. My goodness gracious. Amen. Here's another one. Watch your words at all time. Come on. Proverbs 18, 21 says, power and life, power of life and death is in the tongue. Here's another one. Tell them, that you're, tell them that they're anointed. Tell your children they're anointed. Tell them, tell them that they aren't failures. Tell them that God has a plan for their lives. Yes. Psalms 139, 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You did me together in my mother's womb. Mm, you are the spiritual thermostat. You set the tone. Here's the, number three. Develop. Pastor Ivan, just come up here if you can. Just play the piano so you could. Man, I like the glasses on you, man. Yeah. You, you know they, they're fake glasses. You know. Are they fake? Yeah, they're fake glasses. But they look good, though. It's better to look good than to feel good. Man, it's a good-looking kid. 
Here's, here's, here's number three. Develop spiritual order and leadership. Yeah. Colossians 3, 18 to 21 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and children for this place is the Lord and fathers for they will become discouraged we read it in Ephesians and in Colossians hear this your kids can't rule the house parents stop it stop quit being a weak weak parent and quit allowing your children to dictate the house it's time, parents, it's time for you to quit being submissive parents. Yes. Okay, in my house, my house is not a democracy. It never was. I was a benevolent dictator. The bus stopped with me. Listen, my house... I didn't do this, go to your room, and you want to walk in the kid's room. and Get out of my room. What? You don't pay no mortgage. We didn't even practice, we didn't practice locked doors, right, Zealand? No locked doors. I can walk in anytime. But what if they're naked? I've seen it all. I wiped it, cleaned it. And I didn't do that with my daughter. Now, I will say, I knocked before I went into my daughter's bedroom. But my boys, boy, look at him. They didn't care. They walk around naked anyway. <laughs> None of this. I tell my kids, Jalen's Jill, here, and Zane's back there in the back. Nothing that they have is theirs. I told them one time. I said, listen, them shoes you got, they ain't your shoes, my shoes. But dad, they don't fit you. I don't care. I bought them. They're mine. You get to use them. They need to understand that they receive everything from their mother and father because we love them, but none of it's theirs. In the same way that the house that we live in and the car that we drive and everything that we have is not ours, it's the father's. Are y'all hearing me? You need to remove entitlement from the very, very mouths and mindset of your children. Till this day, my grown kids, if they're at the house and I cook and they eat, Zealand, what do you say? He thanks me every day. And the kids, they, they, they compete with each other. Who's going to say thank you first? If you have children and don't say thank you to you, that's not their fault, it's yours. Come on. Yeah. My kids say thank you because you have to teach them how to say thank you. You have to teach them to honor. Yeah. Teach them to recognize that what they just enjoyed or have is not theirs. So if you break entitlement from them, you'll recognize that they will always seek God and need yeah. God. You'd be surprised by the amount of parents who allow their kids to dictate where they worship God. I heard a parent in this church, and I almost became unglued. And they were they were new, so I'm like, Lord, they don't get it, but I do want to pop them upside the head right now. And they came up to me like, you know, like like they knew what they were doing. Like, yeah, you know, um, my kids are the barometers of our house. Hallelujah. If my kids don't like where we are at church, you know, we're gone. What? What? So I said, so when you walk into a restaurant, if your kids don't like the food, you leave. When you go to a dealership and you want to buy a car, do you then let your kids sit down and take a test drive? When you bought your house, did you not pay attention to what the numbers were? If the kid liked it, you bought it? You, 
listen, you, you fell from the dumb tree and hit every branch on the way down. For real. So what you're basically saying is that you are entrusting your child to the spiritual destiny of your family. On what God's design and plan is, you're giving that to a seven or eight year old. It doesn't make sense. You are the leader of your house. You make the decision. Your children need to know how to, before your children can ever major in leadership, teach them how to follow worship. You're called to, you're called not to follow your children, but to lead them. Lead them with integrity and character. Lead them. I got so much more. Y'all need one more or no? Y'all can, can't handle it? No, no, no. I teach and then I ask publicly then I expect everybody to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Instead they're going, no, 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 no. <laughs> you can one more, you one more. It's going to be late. It's going to be late. Here we go, here we go. Let me give you this last one. Let me give you this last one. Like it makes any, any difference that I removed the iPad, right? All right, so, um, so, so, where was I? What was it, where? Number three, I just finished three. Can I give you number four real quick and I'm done? Always know that your kids are watching you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I have a feeling somebody's watching you. All right. The fact that you are leading them is why they're always watching you. Charles Chuck, Sons, Charles Swindoll, Chuck Swindoll said this, each day of our lives we make deposits in the memory banks of our children. Every day. Watch this. You reproduce what you are. Remember this. Your actions and reactions let your children know what is right or wrong. So that's why we must learn to apologize to our children when we've blown it. Go ahead and throw that up there for me. We have to learn to apologize to our children when we've blown it. Yeah. You, say, well, you just talked about being a benevolent dictator. Yeah, that's the worst where benevolence comes in. Because if I've screwed up, I gotta tell my kids I'm sorry. There's a balance there, guys. I, I didn't say be a submissive. To your children, they were crying. I'm sorry, I should have done it. Yeah, mom, psh, you should not do that. Ooh. And if I catch any kids in this church hitting, hitting mom and dad, I ain't gonna get on to. I'm gonna hit you. You let your kids hit you, I'm gonna hit you. No, I won't hit you, but I'm gonna really, really fantasize about it. Lord have mercy, I've seen that man. I just love our diversity of our church because with a white, with an Anglo family, the kid hits them. Oh, honey, don't do that. Boy, you get a black kid hitting a black mama, it's done. It's done. What? Oh, God. Man, I've been at Walmart, and that kid acted up, and you got grandmama pushing it, and she wearing that moo moo, and she's got that arm, and that, you know, and I'm like, kid, you're going to die. You are dead. Anyways, just learn to, listen, if you get it wrong, if you get it wrong, Apologize to your kids because that reinforces order. The way you go after God produces a desire for your children at a young age. When you're in church, worship God in front of your kids. When you're at home, worship God in front of your kids. 
Tell them the great things of God. Brag on Jesus. Tell your story. Tell your testimony to your children. Children. And whatever you do, throw it up there. Whatever you do, you must always bring them to God's house. The worst thing that you could ever do to your children is be lazy and say, that's okay, we didn't need to go to church today. I have heard our own children say, I wanted to go to church, but my mom and dad didn't bring it. They're honest. They're going to tell on you. I wanted to come to church. What? When your kids want to go to church, but yet you decide that you're going to quote unquote watch online. Watch this. In our eras of Bible history, Parents brought their children to the to public Bible teaching. And those are all your scriptures. Bring the kids. Yes. Psalm 78, 4 says, We will not hide them, which means the testimonies of the Lord, from their children. We will tell the next generation. Here we go. We will what? Tell them the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. So in other words, the way we declare the ways of the Lord is the way they declare the ways of the Lord. When you're fake, they're going to figure it out. I got like six more, which we'll probably cover when I come back again. I'm back on the pulpit again. Listen to me, Discover Life Church. Your calling is to raise a family. If you are not married or don't have any children, this is still your family. All these kids that were up here, you find a way to pour into the next generation. You should have spiritual sons and daughters. You are the discipler. You are, you're doing all this. listen on the 18th on the 19th excuse me we begin a new Timothy team semester and you're saying well how do I what do I got to do be a part of the Timothy team just talk to me or Pastor Andy or Pastor Andrew or Pastor Victoria talk to any of us and you join us on the 19th and you get a couple weeks to determine whether you need to be a part of this. Why? All of this is part of your calling. It helps you recognize your calling. The Timothy team is what we do for discipleship in this house. Amen? Amen. Just talk to us. Pray about it. If you're in this room today, you say, Pastor Manny, I don't, I haven't recognized the general calling. I don't know Jesus. And I'm away from him. And I know he's calling me. He's calling me. But I don't know him and I haven't heard. I've heard him, but I'm, I'm just pushing him away. But you find yourself here today. This is your, you find yourself here today, right now. And you are still hearing his voice. And you've heard this message because God moved heaven and earth to get you here. So you can hear what he's saying to you today. The scripture says, for he who hears, the, when the Lord calls, harden not your heart. He's calling you right now. If you're in this room right now, you're saying, I want to respond to the call of God on my life. If that's you, in the count of three, raise your hand. You know who you are. Be brave. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. One, two, three. Anybody looking here? I see that call out of here. Anybody here? Anybody here? Anybody here? Now, here's, here's, here's something else. Listen, listen. If you're in this room today, you say, Pastor Manny, I know what I'm supposed to. I'm a believer. Lord, Pastor Manny, I'm born again. I am in the general calling. I get it. But I have a specific calling that I haven't responded to, and you want to respond to it. Don't be afraid. If that's you, and you're saying, Pastor Manny, pray for me. I, I really want to respond to a specific calling. If that's you, lift up your hand. Anybody here? 
here, 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 here. I, I see them. I see. These are, this is so good. This is so good. This is so good. If you're in, put your hand down. If you're in this room and you say, Pastor Manny, pray for me. Pray for me. I want to raise my family. I want to respond to the calling to raise a godly family. And I'm a parent and I need help. I, I just need prayer right now so I can do this thing right. If that's you, don't, don't be afraid. Lift up your hand. Anybody, I see all these hands, moms and dads. Every parent really should raise their hand. And even, even parents of, a, of grown kids, you should raise your hand. I, that's me too, man. I mean, my goodness. I, I'm hopefully I'm going to enter the granddad stage here very soon if Zion and Erica starts getting busy. But, but <laughs> they ain't here today, so yeah, yeah, I can say this. Pray that Pastor Manny becomes a granddad really quick. I'm holding all these babies in this church, and I'm becoming, I'm beginning to sin, the sin of envy. I want to be, I always want to be a father. If you're in this room today, and you say, Pastor Manny, I want to learn how to be a spiritual parent. If that's you, raise your hand. Anybody, spiritual mom and dad. Come on, that should be everybody. So that it says everybody raise your hand, and all of them, why don't you stand up? Everybody stand up, come on. Oh, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He, he's so good because he loves us. He's so patient, patient with us. <sighs> Father, give us wisdom. And Lord, when we meditate on this word throughout the week, Help us to write down strategies and questions and as we pursue our spiritual parents, as we, as we pursue our pastors, Lord, as we begin to get things in order so that as parents and future parents, we could obey the call to raise a godly family, a family of your kingdom. We need you, Holy Spirit. Jesus' name. Shout with me, amen. amen. I'm so glad you came today. I hope you learned something today. The power of the Holy Spirit is with you. The day's not over yet because our cafe, I ate this God ordained, glorious, anointed grit bowl with sausage and bacon and cheese. And when I put that in my mouth, I saw angels' wings just floating everywhere. And I thought I was taken to the third heaven. That's how good it was. Make sure you enjoy our cafe in the back. Get some food because there's also crepes. There's also what? Pancake sandwiches? Yeah. Well, I'm trying to, you know, I, I was trying to do protein. But anyways, no, I wasn't. Anyways, so Pastor Andy, tell us about what's happening with the school supplies in the back and dismiss everybody. Sure. All right, guys. So, uh as Pastor Manny said earlier in his message, that uh, what we want to do is like kind of an in-reach. And so what we've done is we've created bags of school supplies, um, some for younger age students and some for high school students. So if you are a parent in this house, um, let's just form an orderly line right here, orderly line. And um, everyone back there is going to give you a hand and help you get the school supplies that you need. Also, if you're an educator, if you don't have children and you're uh, an educator and you need school supplies, go talk to them as well. We've got something for you. Let me pray over us and then we'll get going. God, we love you. We worship you. We give you all the honor and all the praise and all the glory. And we just ask right now, Lord, that you bless every single person in here as they leave from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet all throughout the week. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. Wow, what a powerful time of worship and a good word. Yeah. One of my favorite things to talk about, definitely. Just yeah. The importance of family and raising just that godly family and leaving that legacy. Yeah. For your kids. Yeah, I agree. It was challenging and also, like, very good what I needed this week, you know? Yeah. So we just want to give a few quick reminders before we log off, and we're so glad you logged on with us today. Um, we do not have corporate prayer this Wednesday. Yes. Um, and young adults is being moved from 
um, Sunday nights yes. to Wednesday nights. So we don't have young adults tonight either. So if you're in town and you thought about coming to young adults or youth, don't do it. Nobody will be here. <laughs> so we're so glad you joined us this morning. And we just pray that you have a great week. And you can download the notes and go back and listen to this this week on YouTube or our podcast and other things on Apple. And we're just glad you came with us. And we hope you have a great week.